I want to warn you about what I'm going to start doing tonight in the evening services at 6 o'clock. Uh, we've been known for doing a few controversial things around here at Cedar Heights. Amen. Tonight, uh, for this coming year, I'm going to do the most controversial thing that I've ever done or led our church to do. It's going to start tonight. So just, I want to warn you, I guess, as much as inform you. When you think about all we've done, you know, this is by far, and I'm not, uh, this is not idle words, the most controversial thing I've ever done I'm going to do tonight. And that is I'm going to take a year on Sunday nights to teach us about God's name. Um, I've referred to it several times over the years here. Um, God's name has been defamed, has been defrauded, has been eliminated from our translations. Um, most Christians in the world today have never even heard God's name, never even heard God's name one time, which is remarkable to me. When I was in seminary, I had the great opportunity, privilege, of uh, serving under Dr. J. Heflin, who was in, at Southwestern Seminary, sat in the chair of Old Testament criticism. He was also our Hebrew um, main professor, what it, Hebrew professor in Old Testament criticism chair. And I got to be his grader that year. That was a, a remarkable opportunity experience. And so I had to dive into the Hebrew itself because <laughs> It, as it turned out, there were times I actually was teaching, when Dr. Heflin was out of town, I would teach the Hebrew course that I was taking. It was kind of a weird situation. But I just fell in love with the, with the Hebrew language and studying it. And one, one thing that really shocked me was when I found out that God had a name. You know, not just a title, but he had a name. Like, my name's Chuck. God has a name. And, um, and I'm not talking about Jesus, I'm talking about God has a name. And then I found out over that that name in the Old Testament scriptures is recorded over 6,800 times. Now I just want you to think with me about this. Over 6,800 times in the Old Testament through the inspiration, we believe in the inspiration of scripture, right? I mean, we, we're on that stump. We beat that stump to death. I believe the Bible's in verbally inspired word of God. Amen? Well, in the word of God, in the Old Testament, over 6,800 times, God's spirit inspired the writers to record God's personal name. Over 6,800, I think, 52 times. And I don't know, it's just the way my demented mind works. So, you know, over the course of years, I've, I've been thinking, do you think he might want us to know his name, to inspire it over 6,800 times? You know? I think there must be something to that. And then I, go, and then I come to my English translations, and it's not in there one time. In my mind, I'm thinking, what? Well, I found out, you know, through studying, and this has been a progress of decades, you know. Um, the reason why th is because God got really upset with Israel back in the Old Testament days, 2,500 years ago, and he said, you're not going to say my name anymore. It was, a, it was judgment against Israel because of sin and all that kind of stuff. God said, don't even speak my name. Don't even say my name. And so they didn't. And so we've gone through thousands of years, literally thousands of years now of human history, where God's name was never even spoken, never on the tongue of humanity because of judgment. I want you to look real quick. This isn't our sermon today, but in John chapter 17, I want to sh show you uh, two verses real quick. This is what we usually call the high intercessory prayer of Jesus Christ or the priestly prayer of Christ where he prays. I want to show just two verses, John 17, verse 6 and verse 26. 
John 17, 6 and verse 26. As Christ is um, praying and praying about his disciples in verse number 6, look how it opens up. He says, I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. You see that? I've revealed your name. Do you know why I had to pray that? <clears throat> because they had lost God's name. Now look at, look at verse 26. <clears throat> I made your name known to them and will make it known so the love you've loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. That 6,823 times in the Old Testament God revealed his name but now then we don't know his name. And Jesus prayed his purpose for coming was to, to reveal God's name again. So what I'm doing is um, I've written, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm working on um, 365 lessons on the name of God. I was so excited when the Holman Christian Standard Translation came out because 84 times in the Old Testament our Holman translators have given us God's name back. They put it right in the text, 84 times. I was, I did handstands. I did, I literally was at the Baptist bookstore, Lifeway bookstore, <clears throat> when the first truck, when the first shipment came out of the Holman translation, I was standing there and I got my first copy out of the box off the truck before they could put it on the shelf because they've given us God's name back in our translation. So I'm, I've written 306, I'm writing, I've written 270 something lessons, but we're going to have 365 lessons on the name of God, and I'm going to compress that end of one year on Sunday nights. Would it be okay if I taught you all about God's name? <clears throat> For example, when the scripture says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Now think a second. How can you call on the name of the Lord if you don't know his name? So we're going to, that's what I'm going to do on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock for about a year. Just um, by the grace of God, reintroduce at least Cedar Heights Baptist Church to God's name. Now if you want to kind of do homework before you come, I'm every day on my Facebook page, I'm posting one of those 365 lessons on my Facebook page about God's name every day. And so like what I'm going to be sharing tonight is what I posted this past week, the first full week of January. So I'll be using, that'll be my outline for tonight, those lessons that we uh, looked at this past week. All right? So um, it's pretty radical, I know. But I believe that we're fulfilling what Jesus said, I've come to reveal your name. And so for this coming year on Sunday nights, by the grace of God and in the spirit of Christ, we're going to reveal God's name to Cedar Heights and all that's involved, all that means in the name of the Lord. Amen. Okay, turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 12. We're going to carry on with this, uh, this uh, TV title thing for a while. <laughs> I've had, I've had probably too much fun with it. So I'm going to have some more fun. And I might do it this whole year. We'll see on Sunday mornings. But one of the new programs that's on TV is titled Revenge. Have you all seen Revenge yet? Anybody? Nobody, wants, nobody in the 830 service would admit they've watched it. Nobody here has watched Revenge? Ah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, man, thank you. <clears throat> I went through, I went back and uh, on the ABC website you can go, they do, a, they do a description and I've watched, I looked at just a description of the first 10 episodes. They've had 10 episodes uh, before this year started, now 11 and 12 have played. <clears throat> so I have the general idea of what the show's about. But you know, revenge is a natural, I want to stress this point, revenge, the feeling of revenge is a natural <coughs> human emotion. It's as normal as breathing air. If somebody hurts me or disappoints me or what, you know, I have feelings of revenge. Amen? Anybody ever felt revenge? 
Everybody raise your hand, okay? <laughs> it's not a trick question. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's normal. It's natural. The only problem is with this is that God has not called us to live normal lives. God has not called us to live natural lives. As a matter of fact, he's invested a lot in us. When he's invested the Holy Spirit in us, you know, we teach, we say that the Spirit of God dwells in us. Amen? That's a pretty big statement to say the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's a pretty big statement to say the old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That my old man is dead, I'm buried, and I'm raised to walk a new life in Christ. That I'm led by the Spirit, I'm empowered by the Spirit. I have the Word of God to teach me and instruct me. I, uh, there ought to be something different in our life if we are truly doing what we say, living a Spirit-filled, empowered life. We shouldn't be normal people. <laughs> and the Word of God will uphold what I'm saying there. We should not be normal. There should be a marked difference between the child of God and the child without God. All right? And this is one of those areas here in the area of revenge. Stand with me. I'm going to just read uh, Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Through the end of the chapter, we'll have a prayer. The focus verse is going to be verse number 19 where it says don't revenge, don't avenge yourselves. That's going to be where we're going to jump off for just a few minutes. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, the first 11 chapters are a big, that's a major theological kind of treatise about salvation and sin and redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ and the relationship of Israel, the nation of Israel to the church now. That's 9, 10, and 11, those three chapters. But so the first 11 chapters of Romans are a major theological teaching. Now then, from chapter 12 through 16 through the end of the chapter is application. All right? How do we apply these truths to our life? Or what impact, what difference should this make in the life of a child of God? Now that we have this big bulk of truth in our life, what should we look like? How should we live? And so that's where we pick up here in chapter 12. Verse number 9. Love must be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what's good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what's honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath, for it's written, Vengeance belongs to me, I'll repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you'll be heaping fiery coals on his head. And here's the bottom line. Don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for this day and for your great name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. Now what Paul does here at the end when he quotes this uh, verse number 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. What he does is he's giving us an address, all right? He's given us an address. So turn with me back to Proverbs chapter 25. He's given us a biblical address. Like uh, whenever we give a biblical address, like I just said, turn to Proverbs 25. We're going to look at verse 21 and 22. I'm giving you an address in the Bible. But now, you know, in the time of Christ and the New Testament in the Bible times, they didn't have chapters and verses. So what they did was they would, they would quote a verse or something to give an address because they knew the Word of God. They didn't need chapters and verses. Uh, and so what they would do when they wanted to tell you where something was in a book, they would just repeat part of the line and you knew where it was, okay? And so what Paul's doing, he's giving us an address here. This is what Jesus did when he was on Calvary, for example. When he was dying on the cross, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A lot of, you know, contemporary, modern-day believers don't have the slightest idea what he meant. 
because he was giving us an address. He was giving us Psalm 22. Psalm 22 opens up. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? And from the words of my groaning. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of thy people Israel. Jesus Christ wasn't just babbling out of his head saying he was giving us an address for us to go study Psalm 22 because it had something to say about what was going on on Calvary. All right, if you want to know something about what was going on in Calvary, go study Psalm 22. That's why Jesus gave us that address. Well, Paul gives us this address, uh, Proverbs tw uh, chapter 24, uh, verse 21, 25, I mean 21. If your enemy is hungry, see word for word quote, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink, for you'll heap fiery, heap coals on his head. Now look how verse 22 ends. And the Lord will reward you. Alright? How many of us um, would like to be rewarded by God? Amen. How many of us would like to not be rewarded by God? <laughs> well, here's, here's something that the Word of God tells us. If you want to know one sure-fired way to make sure that you receive a reward from God is just love your enemies. And not just love them in word, but love them in deed. You know, doing good things for them. And God will reward you. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit right off the bat, that ain't normal, amen? That's not normal. That's not natural. That's not what I feel like. And let me preface this real quick. Uh, Paul, we can go back to Romans, Paul's not saying, you know, let somebody hurt you. You know, we're not talking about breaking laws like stealing stuff and shooting stuff and, you know, a physical abuse and those kind of, we're not talking about that because when you go over to the next chapter of Romans, chapter 13, he opens up and says, uh, there are governing authorities that are sent here to execute wrath against those kind of actions. We're, so we're not talking about laying down and being a rug for someone to harm, uh, steal, you know, those kind of criminal activities. Matter of fact, there in the first four verses of Romans chapter 13, Paul says that they're ministers of God to execute wrath against the ungodly. Two different times he uses that word minister. It's the very same Greek word in the New Testament for ministers that are ordained by God, you know, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our ministers, our law enforcement agencies, our military, they are ministers. They are called, just as surely as I've been called by God to preach, our law enforcement's been called by God to execute, as he says, wrath against the ungodly. So Paul, you know, he's very quick. As soon as he finishes this part of Romans 12 about, you know, doing good and not helping your enemy, he wants us to know now, but we're not talking about letting people just get by with, criminal activity, all right? Once That's very clear for, for him there. Yahweh's reward. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I, this is our, our Lord's prayer, the model prayer. Look at verse 12. This has always been a real sobering verse for me. <laughs> verse, chapter 6, verse 12. This is in the model prayer. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Have you ever paid attention to what he's saying there? <laughs> I'm going to, Lord, do you want me to pray and ask God to forgive me? Um, <clears throat> The the, uh, the, uh, the you want me to forgive like to be forgiven like I forgive? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what he means. All right. So whenever I whenever I start feeling kind of uh, vengeful, you know, like I want to pay back a little bit, or you know, I got you know, you, I got something I'm going to say to you. Amen. Yeah. 
this verse just comes picking at my brain. Is that the way I want to be treated? And um, there's one even worse than this. I mean, that's just kind of... Look at uh, Matthew chapter 18. Well, and then we're going to get worse than this. This is the next step of worse as far as dealing with our human nature. What's normal, what's natural. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse number 22. It's kind of stuck in their craw, you know. The, now, these are the disciples he's talking to, the apostles. You know, Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, those guys. He's, Peter says in verse 21, Peter comes. Now, Peter, let's give him credit. He had, an, he had enough gumption to say what was on his mind, amen. He, when he had questions, he'd ask him. Peter came up and says, Lord, uh, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. You see, in the Talmud, in the Jewish writings, the legal experts, as, you know, since the end of the New Testament till Christ, that 500-year period, they'd come up with you know, several hundred of their own laws that they'd kind of added to God's law. And one of them was they had come up with this idea that if somebody wronged you, it was okay to hate them. Hatred was not a bad deal in the Jewish Talmud thing. You know, they gave permission to hate. And now then this Jesus dude, he comes preaching something else, you know. <laughs> he talks about, blessed are you when men will revile you and persecute you and say all manner, manner of evil falsely. What? So Peter says, what about this? Seven times, and that was one of the rules in the Talmud. If somebody does something seven times, you know, and don't, if they don't make it right, you can hate them. All right? So they felt real good about running around with their nose in the air, hating people. All right, Jesus says, I tell you, verse 22, I tell you, not as many as seven times, he says, but 70 times seven. And then he goes on to... The, just read the rest of those red letters there. He goes on talking about how this guy wouldn't forgive. He owed him something. He had a debt, and he wouldn't forgive it. And the Lord, oh, it was bad. You can, you can read it. The Lord, in other words, the God expects us, what I like to call in this next point, Matthew chapter 18, in, here in 18, a forgiving personality. Did you all see this this past week, the deal about a dog? Uh, on the TV where dogs can tell what kind of person you are. Did y'all see that? I thought that was interesting. I know our dog, Lucy. My dog, Lucy, she judges me every second of the day. When I walk in the door, I, will, I look at her eyes. She's looking, what kind of mood's he in today? She knows when to run and hide under the bed, Amen. She knows when to hide from me when I'm going to bed at night because I don't want her in my bed. You know, I'm, my dog's reading me all the time. My dog's pretty smart. When you're around people, it doesn't take us very long to read people either, does it? I mean, you know pretty quick when you're around a disgruntled, bitter, vengeful, angry person, don't you? Now, I know some shysters, they put on a good show, but well, when you're around somebody that's bitter, I, I saw this quote the other day, I really like it a lot, about the right way to get revenge as a Christian. You ready? A good Christian revenge, the way to really get back at the person you want to get back at is just uh, be happy. If you really want to get vengeance, be happy. That'll, that'll do them in. Last point, turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is the last one, and this is really, for me, this is kind of like the last nail in the coffin of my natural, normal human nature when it comes to wanting revenge. Want to get even. Verse 31, all bitterness, anger, wrath, insult, and slander must be removed from you, <clears throat> along with all wickedness. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. Look, here's the nail in the coffin. Just as God also forgave you in Christ. 
Boy, that, that digs pretty deep, doesn't it? Have, um, have I been forgiven? Yeah. By the blood of Jesus Christ? Yeah. God says, well, then you be like that. You be like that. Don't be normal. I want us to bow for a word of prayer. Is it wrong to be normal? No, it's not wrong. Normal's normal. Is it wrong for a Christian to act normal? Yeah. It's wrong. It's wrong. Will God reward us being normal? No. God has set a pretty high bar for us, hasn't he? We talk about, you know, setting a standard or setting a bar. That's a pretty high standard. That's a pretty high bar he sets up there. It's called um, Christ. It's called Christ. It's a pretty high bar. And it's not normal. Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for your word, and we thank you for uh, the truth of your word. And we want to thank you. I want to thank you that not only do you teach us how we should live, but with everything you teach us how as we yield to you, you will empower us. You will empower us to do and be the people that you've called us to be. It's all of you. It's all about you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Joel, you lead us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on the Jesus, we believe your own. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your
sing this together. When this passing world is over, we will see you face to face. And forever we will worship Jesus here. Jesus, you are.